that proposition. It is unfair that some people around the world are discriminated because of their sexual orientation. It is unfair that people in Uganda who are found to be homosexuals are hanged. But because the road to hell is paved with good intentions, we are going to show you that they actually cause more harm than good, and our policy far better fulfills the yardstick that we better promote the rights of sexual minorities and we maintain the status of the EU as a bastion for progress in developmental countries. I'm going to present, we're going to present three lines of substantive arguments. I'm going to show you how we improve the human condition, how we practically empower sexual expression, and my second speaker, Joshua, will then show to you how we maintain the EU's credibility in developing countries. But first, because they lack the definition, I'm going to present a simple working definition of what a foreign aid means. Foreign aid can be split into two large categories, either developmental aid or humanitarian aid. Humanitarian aid refers to the immediate aid to alleviate suffering after calamities such as natural disasters. For instance, Red Cross providing aid to Haiti after the natural disasters there. Developmental aid on the other hand refers to aid given to develop basic infrastructure and necessary amenities to break out of the clutches of poverty. For instance, building schools or providing mosquito nets to countries where they lack the money to do so. But let's look at the context in which today's debate takes place. Basic necessities like clean water, like shelter, like healthcare, these are fundamental necessities that are lacking in many of these countries. But worse still, education is often inaccessible, where the only source of information is folklore and cultural teachings. The same kind of the entrenchment of these beliefs in societal expectations that I thought people I heard about. Therefore, often these bigotry and discriminatory, discriminatory practices are entrenched within societal perceptions and, and practices. Therefore, we stand for a policy that is simple. The first clause of the policy is that foreign aid will be offered regardless of existing standards of treatment of the LGBT community, the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transistor community. The second clause is that pre-existing modes of delivery will be promoted to, to avoid the misuse of aid, for instance, providing direct aid to the communities to transcend potential corruption, for instance. But first, and before I move on to my points of substantive, I'm going to ask two large questions to be bottled. Firstly, is the policy feasible? And are they really going to help the sexual minorities? And here's where I'm going to start off with their policy, which was really lacking. They never told us who really is going to get the aid. They said EU. Really, who within the EU? The richer countries, the poorer countries, the entire EU. They need to show us that. But moreover, when do they give the aid? How much aid is going to be given? And at more, most crucially, at what point of, the, of time is aid going to be given? At what point of time of sexual minority concessions are they going to give aid? In Uganda, when that sentence is given to any gay individuals, is it sufficient that this legislation is taken away when societal repression and societal stigmatization still exist? What point of time is it all right in that policy to begin resuming aid? I'm going to move on to my second question of rebuttal on do they really help the sexual minority? And here's when I point out to you that we fundamentally agree with everything the first speaker said. We agree that it's fundamentally wrong that some people are suffering, but they never showed us that. Is it necessary? Are there, is the policy really going to work? Are they really going to change the, so, the societal perceptions that are entrenched within society just because the governments are willing to do so? It is not that easy to change. They simply told us how then did women receive their rights. We tell you today, women receive their rights in many of the developed countries through a ground up movement. The same kind of movement that we hope to bring about through things like education, which can only come about when you first give them developmental aid to build schools. I'll be following these lines of analysis later in my substantive and I'll flag them out. I'm going to be transiting on to my first point of substance. I'll take you a minute, uh, any one of you, on improving human, human conditions. And the thesis is that foreign aid should be, should be for the purpose of upliftment and should never be tied. Before I move on, yes, madam. Sir, part of the foreign aid that we are giving to these countries, of course, is education. We want to tie it to that, including missions and so on. Hold on, hold on a minute. They say they want to give aid while the, these LGBT executions are still taking place. Something tells me that fundamentally they don't stand for Thai aid after all because after all Thai aid means that, the, that they will only give aid when certain prerequisites are met and these prerequisites within this motion necessitates them to debate on the, on the conditions of giving aid only when LGBT rights are given. We don't want to fulfill their side of the motion. But I'm going to be transiting back on to my point of substantive. And the logic is that aid is fundamentally altruistic and aimed to preserve uh, and is based on preserving the it is based on the injustice of suffering and hence a longing to resolve this injustice. And this is the principle of the commonality of man. 
where inherently seeing suffering causes an instinctive response to alleviate the seen suffering. It was never meant to be a bargaining chip for, for change. Tying aid fundamentally undermines the nature of aid because it becomes an incentive or reward rather than what it was first meant to be. Fundamentally, the nature is hijacked as aid is hijacked by foreign agendas. But specific to sexual minorities, we recognize that aid aims to improve the human condition by empowering the right to life as the first wellspring to all other rights, including sexual expression. In countries where the, uh, where the basic survivability is in question, we think that their expectations for higher levels of rights are simply unfeasible. We fundamentally recognize this hierarchy of rights as seen in the United Nations Millennium Development Goals, which are highly specific to first provide medical care for the dying and clean water for those who need it the most before they then move on to higher levels of rights. Fundamentally, in an ideal world, we like to have them all. But the fact is that many of these developing countries can't afford it. Their first priority is to save the dying children, to save the dying men on the street. I'll take you in a minute, sir. Therefore, principally, aid should not be tied as it is a corruption of the true meaning of aid and fails to uplift the human condition as a prerequisite for change. Yes, sir. Well, do you think that um, tying this aid doesn't mean that we will still support the building of schools and still support um, digging wells for the water or something? You need to show us how these, co these countries are going to be building schools and digging water if they don't even have the money to do so and you're unwilling to give them any form of aid to help them out. I'm going to be moving back onto my point of substantive on empowering sexual expression. And the thesis is that empowering social change through aid. And then let's look at the context of the countries where these aid are most needed. These countries are entrenched in culture and a psyche of discrimination against these groups, where they lack the education and exposure of alternative perceptions. Let's look at Uganda, where death penalty is reserved for kings, which is a result of deep-rooted cultural entrenchment of these stereotypes within the psyche. Let's look at Pakistan, where homosexuals on the streets are at risk of getting set on fire by their neighbours as much as they are on risk of getting set on fire by their own parents because they're seen as if it's great. This is the this is the result of a lack of the most basic of education, where the concept of human rights which they champion is as alien to them as the concept of their suffering is to the developing country. Through aid, we increase the basic infrastructure, we allow ideas to be expressed through education and innovation. We allow schools to teach things like gender studies, history, literature, philosophy, the basis of, of ground up movements. We've seen this in Saudi Arabia, where through stability and education, the rights of women were realized because they accept that women had the right to freedom to try, for instance. Therefore, we support a ground up movement and acceptance that this can only come about when you allow societal perceptions to be changed and the people to become accepting of the ideas of LGBTs. In their case, societal psyches are cracked down on and not changed overnight, and governments never receive the aid to change society. So we've shown you that principally, we protect the true nature of aid, and practically, we truly empower the sexual minority. For those reasons, we are proud to oppose.